Now, if people aren't immersed to that and they're coming into the organization in a flexible working world, it's a little bit different to bring that in. So we're now going to shift in the way we do things around here. It's shifting very fast. So as leaders, how can we lean in and understand from the employees how they want the behaviors to shift while you create those flexible boundaries we spoke about earlier? Create the boundaries, but then let them have some freedom to establishing what are those, those behaviors and the way we do things in each area. I think this, it's starting to shift towards that. Now this is a session where we will have a panel discussion with the experts here. Craig, the CEO of Speakers Institute Corporate. We have Juanita, one of the foremost facilitators at SIC, who takes care of emotional intelligence. Welcome. Thank you. And now we are here, not only to discuss about how we are responding to this culture change with a, with a flexible working environment. And that's why we have them to put forward their views. And please make sure you have your questions written. You will have time to ask. So Craig, let me start with you. What exactly do culture mean to you? It's a great question. And when we look at culture inside organizations, you know, quite often people are looking to see how can it be established by a leader? who just states, here's the culture, come with me. Uh, but we know that inside the organizations, there's so many different aspects that come into play and that the employees have a big part of it. For me, I've stayed away from this tradition of having values. And I don't think values actually create culture. The word value in people's minds subconsciously takes them to what do I value in life? Now, everyone values different things depending on their environment. So to bring people in and go, here, you must fit into these five values, subconsciously doesn't always work, and most of the time doesn't. We can't force people to change their values inside a workplace based on what they've known their entire environment. So for me, it's I think you need to be able to separate and understand what is the DNA of the company. I spoke about it a bit earlier in the gravity of leadership. What is the DNA? And it is around the things of the way we do things around here, the way we behave around here, the way we, the, the boundaries we create, the way we want to respond to things. And now I know some people might sit up and go, the way we do things around here, we don't like that. <laughs> that, that holds it. But it's about being open in that space to the way we do things around here. Because that's what culture is. It brings it in. Now, if people aren't immersed to that and they're coming into the organization in a flexible working world, it's a little bit different to bring that in. So we're now going to shift in the way we do things around here. It's shifting very fast. So as leaders, how can we lean in and understand from the employees how they want the behaviors to shift while you create those flexible boundaries we spoke about earlier. Create the boundaries, but then let them have some freedom to establishing what are those, those behaviors and the way we do things in each area. I think this, it's starting to shift towards that. That's a profound insight about culture. Juanita, next to you. Sure. As you discuss and as, as you meet so many leaders around, what are the exact strategies or changes that they are brought in, especially after these two to three years where we were into the pandemic situation? What are those aspects that you have observed? Thank you, Jovi, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, I think this last two years working with global leaders across, sitting in my home in Bangalore, is first of all being enlightening. When it comes to culture, Jovi and uh, Craig, you're absolutely right. Um, one of the things uh, that I have predominantly noticed in most of the large corporates is the power of listening. In fact, I was working with one of the clients in Nepal, Australia. They had both the places. Until then, everything was business driven. You 
drive everything with numbers. Every conversation of your in the morning meeting would start with what's a number, what are you doing, how's the day going, what are you going to get at the end of the day. And here there was a huge paradigm shift where the leaders, at one point of time, I, I designed a session for them where the whole idea was, can we just listen to you? And the CEO of the organization and the head of HR just didn't speak a word in the entire one hour. And all they did was just listen to their employees who were speaking. And for me personally, that was a huge culture shift where predominantly most of the time you see leaders speak. Like how Sam said, you tell, 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 tell. And here, the absolute one hour, all they did was just listen. So that is something that I'm seeing in many of the organizations. In fact, I'm also having the, you know, leaders reaching out saying, can you take us through the power of listening? And it's amazing that how we have two years and we use it's so less. The second strategy that I'm also finding in culture is uh, understanding people. So there have been a lot of um, you know, yeah, focus group discussions happening at the uh, ground level, then pulling in to the senior level. So if you actually see, it's just no more in the boardroom that gets decided on the culture, but actually culture is driven from the ground level. So it's no more the top down approach, Rather, it is the bottom-up approach where people get to listen and understand what is the, that you consider as culture. That's a huge shift. And Judy, I can just go on. Well, I think, you know, post the talk, we will have a talk out and maybe we can catch up with a little more strategies as well. Yeah. Just can I, I, I go on? I think that's really important. You brought up something about the listening. And it, it's part of that sense of belonging, right? People want to feel heard. They want to know that people care about the work that they do and who they are matters. And they want to feel respected. And I think that that active listening and being able to create those spaces has been lost over the last couple of years in remote spaces where we've gone, okay, we need to reduce the size of meetings. We don't want people online as long. But what they didn't realize is they took away the spaces where people could connect and feel heard and we've ended up in a lot of times where we create these spaces that are so uh, structured in a way that doesn't enable everyone to have their voice heard. Oh, yeah. And that part is where people feel that sense of belonging. When can they feel heard? Yeah. And I'm going to disrupt diversity and inclusion. <laughs> Inclusion's been talked about as being how do we include gender? How do we include age? How do we include race? We can actually solve this by going to the unknown problem here. And that is just how do we ensure that everyone feels included in this world? Think back to a time when you were a young kid at school or a moment in your life where you felt excluded from something. Was it something that someone said? Was it the way a, a group behave and left you to the side? This is where inclusion's moving. If we're still talking about race and gender and age right now, we are 20 years behind the diversity and inclusion conversation. We need to be shifting into what is the inclusive language? What is the inclusive opportunities to ensure people are heard? What are the, what are the ways that we can I suppose, get people to reflect and understand when they may accidentally be excluding people. We don't realize we're doing it. But it is so important. That aspect of diversity and inclusion. I could go on about diversity yes. for a while as well, but I'm not going to. <laughs> no, totally. I'll leave it there. I think this was needed and this, this is the discussion we are having. And uh, as we move forward, this, this is just one question with, from you, Craig. Most of you HR leaders out here, I'm sure you would have faced so many challenges when it comes to bringing in a culture change. So when you started talking to these executives, especially during these uh, two years, what were their challenges like? Uh, so a couple of different things. One, the first one was when we've got new graduates coming into the organization who have recently graduated at a university, how do we 
how do we get them to build their social experience? Because if you think about it, a lot of them have graduated university where they were probably living at home. They're now still living at home because of remote working. They're in these spaces where they go into companies where generally they're still very, 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 very junior. So they don't get their voice heard very often. So they haven't had many social interactions. So when you bring them in person or put them in front of clients, how do you expect them to interact in those environments when you haven't created them for them? Or they haven't created them for themselves? So that whole how do we build that social experience and make sure people don't feel awkward when they come back into the office and feel even more separated from those that have been in the organization for a really, really long time. You think about it, those that have been in your organization for 10 years, they will come straight back in and fit right in. But those who have only been around, or only just arrived, are going to find it really difficult to fit in if they're still in, got lacking that social experience. The second one is obviously now how do we understand the balance of kind of that employee flexibility to building the culture? How do we create a way that everyone feels connected even though some people may always be in the office or in the front line, whereas others can be at home however they like, wherever they like? How do we marry those two together? And I think that's a big challenge and I don't have, a, have an answer for you and I think it will be very different in each organization. But how do we connect those together uh, is probably the second one. And then the third one is we've got all this space. Now how do we create new spaces inside our buildings so that when people do come back, they're able to collaborate? How are they able to connect and create that sense of belonging? Rather than just creating, oh, cool, where can we put gadgets? All right, let's put hot, space, um, hot stations here, which are quite annoying for people because they can't find the right cable all the time. But how can we create those collaboration spaces are, th are the bigger topics that are happening as, we, as they build that culture coming back. Yeah, thank you so much, Craig. And this all summarizes people first. Yeah? It's, it's, it's becoming a topic of how belonged we feel to this place where we are working. So as I just move on, is there any question you would like to ask in regards to responding to culture change? Yes, please. Uh, my name is Koshik. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll start off here. Yeah. Okay. You can't remove it. Um, people are competitive. People want to move up the ladder and as they move up the ladder, people will try to you know, find their way to get in. And you know, sometimes that goes into a negative space where we will sideline someone to get ourselves into a better position. I'm not sure we can ever remove that. Obviously, we want to create as many collaboration sort of way of working and, and et cetera as we can, but there is going to be competition. So I don't think we can remove it. Uh, I think it is obviously some greater education at the higher level around how they can role model behaviors and look at ways that we can help people be recognized and rewarded and grow with inside an organization without having to take out someone else. There's no simple answer to that, I don't think. And we have a competitive nature as human beings. How can we avoid that when people want to rise up the ranks? I'm not sure I know the answer to that one. The other thing which I've been seeing when it comes Yeah, I think from the diversity point of view as well, very much like the inclusion. Uh, if you're still talking about gender diversity, race diversity, age diversity in your organization, you're 20 years behind. And give, to give an example with both Speakers Institute, which is a sister company to Speakers Institute Corporate. They deal with personal development. We deal with professional development. Both Sam and I are known for employing or recruiting contractors that are like no one else in the organization. And that is on diversity of thought, diversity of background. Have you lived in multiple countries? What industries have you worked in? Uh, what, uh, what was life like growing up for you? Did you have it easy? Did you have it hard? Were you the trouble kid or were you the liked kid? Uh, and for us, we're always looking at different people. We've turned away amazingly talented people because they're like someone else on our team. And we know that we're not going to grow if, if we keep bringing in like-minded people. 
for me, for whatever reason, I actually lean my ear towards people that I agitate me because I want to know why they think that way. What have they caught? I don't know. That's how I like to live because that's how I get better. I always cringe when I see someone at a conference who goes, I don't like that person and walks out. Oh, wait, you've just missed out on a great opportunity to learn. It may help you understand why you think a certain way even more. That's okay. But if you walk away, you might miss something that helps you think in a different way and different perspective. And that's why that whole diversity of the people we put in our organizations and our teams is so crucial. Really, really important. This is so great to know about these insights. I think if you wanted to speak. And, and I think this is something that is so, I was going to touch on at the end, but I'll bring it forward now. In your organizations, how can you create tight feedback loops? Gone are the days of the six-month, the 12-month performance reviews. Yes, they're still good to have, but if that's the only time you were talking about the performance of an individual, you're going to be so far away from what the truth is on that day, it's not funny. How can you create a tight feedback loop so you're giving feedback every single day to your employees, to your team members, to even yourself? How can you create that? So, and for something we do when we go and facilitate with uh, different companies and do corporate training, and we do for ourselves, is we talk about gems and opportunities. So gem is something you did really well, that might be 20%. Then you go into opportunities, what can you do better? And it's all about how you frame it. It's about taking it away from being a personal attack. So you did this, I saw you do this, you disappointed me this way, to what I noticed was, my encouragement to you is, have you ever tried this? So it's just changing that subtle shift of language. So it's not a personal attack. It's now situation off to the side. It's kind of like a three-point communication in a way. It's a subtle way of doing that where you separate the person from the area they can improve. And if you can do that every single day, then you're going to remove those huge conflicts, uh, which are still important to have, but in the right way. Actually, for those who know French, who knows French? Anyone here? Confrontation. So confrontra confrontation probably here in India or in New Zealand or in Australia is very, it's, it's butting heads. But in French, it is actually about a constructive debate. So at L'Oreal, you know, the, the famous um, cosmetic. cosmetic company, yeah. they actually have the confrontation room in France where you actually sit in the pit and everyone sits around you when you bring a new idea. And they will give you the gems and they will give you the opportunities and it's, it's pretty full on, but that's how they grow and develop great products. So you still need some conflict. You can't do that all the time. That's a great question. Yeah, thank you so much, Craig and Manita. Thank you to all of you. This just shows that there are some really empathetic leaders seated here who really want to help out people bringing in this culture change. Thank you for this discussion. Thank you, Craig. Very thank good. You. Let's give a big round of applause. Thank you very much.